you know that wonderful scene where actually they all sit down and, and in the end harmony is restored? I thought that was a very positive scene. You know where he around the dinner table yes. after he's after he's coming, but they don't talk. You have to always so the they people are talking. They're not talking. It's but after he has his little hissy fit and after he goes storming off and after they coax him down and he has his wine with the cold feet and, and it's clear that harmony is restored. It is it is very true. It is a very moving scene when he goes upstairs and he takes Julia by the hand and he brings her down and they sit down and it's very funny. The, the dinner was cold and now we can begin. It's a very funny sentence because it is so typical. We have all been there. Okay? But, but dinner was cold, but we sit down to eat it. I, I don't buy that he's a shunil. Yeah, that's one way of looking at him, but there's other ways too. For instance, his colleagues like him. He seems to be a funny guy. They respect his opinions. Of course, he's got his this. colleagues. What are you talking about? Shadowfire and Hood and Hood Idol? They're very <laughs> colleagues. They are comic characters. Well, they are very really funny. They, I mean, I, they I actually funny. left my head off there. And. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a yeah, so not so right. <laughs> Well, you are asked, in terms of uh, talking about the truth, the truth cannot be established because we have limited personal, personal point of view. The only, the only perspective we ever have is the one of the narrator. However, okay, as in, I, mean, I don't know if this occurred to you, I started this, this um, Swan Villa being very serious, and as it was developing, I found myself laughing more and more often. Because just stuff is happening to this guy that really oughtn't to be happening. And the point at which I really laughed the hardest was uh, at the at the end when the when the carpet comes. Okay, so so the whole his whole life is about to fall apart. Uh, Moza is about to have an abortion. I think at this point she's she's decided not to have it. And the dog failed the, the test. And Re, Re, Regina Regina is this that the other thing. And he can't sell the house and he's dependent on his wife. And the wife has just gone off. And the Bundesbahn and the and the and the railway delivers a plastic sausage. Sausage, right? You have, you have to see what Walzer does with one word, in which he transforms a cash on for which he has just paid about 9,000 marks, which is a lot of money in 1977, into a plastic sausage. You can't beat this because at this point, this carpet, with its life falling apart, isn't worth more than a plastic sausage. Unbelievable. And that is, that is what Walzer is good about, Limoges at the very right time, commenting on what the value of this carpet is to him at this point. Well, I, and that's good, that is what's good about but it. But his life isn't always like Okay, Clive, one can comment, and Virginia, and you? This is almost Cholim Aleichem. But I was, but I was, but I, but I was, I was thinking about that there is, um, there is. I mean, some people have written that Shlemir from Kai Kamisa, but I don't, I don't, I don't see that. I do think there is a Luftmensch kind of um, character to this person who has to make something out of nothing. You have to make money out of nothing. Why does he defend the real estate profession? Uh, the the, the makla beruf because it depends only on the person who is doing it, just like the writer. To be a, a, a real estate agent, to be a makla, and to be a writer is very similar for Valza because both of them have to put their own personality into the marketplace. They have to sell something that another person doesn't really want. And we we'll always look at it very suspiciously. What you have to offer, I'm going to have to criticize that. So Valzer is really milking that comparison basically for, for, for all it's worth. So the critical response to what you have to offer, that it depends only on you, that you can never reveal yourself fully as a mock, when you cannot say anything, you have to say personal things in order to get people hooked, 
but you can never say who you truly are. So these comparisons certainly flow into this book, Virginia. Well, the fact that the rug comes in plastic, there's such a, a contrast between this modern che cheesy plastic and the beautiful old rug. And then the other thing I wanted to ask, in um, Spleen de Fert, yeah, is this Klaus some sort of a Faust figure, in a way? Why do you, how do you see that? Well, could you because you he's always to him and telling him, having grandiose ideas. He could perform better, he could do this, he could do that. I'm not seeing it. Can you guys see that? And the Faust figure? I am not sure. Let's work, on it. Let's work this out a little bit. So we have these, we have these four characters in, uh, in, in Feeding the Fear. So we have Klaus, who is with Hell, and we have Hell, who is with, uh, what's her name? Sabine. Sabina. Sabina. I was going to say that in Dutch, Sabine, because I have best friends, not Sabine. Sabina. Okay, so we have here, and of course, good. Now, what do we do with this? So this is Helena, actually. Okay, so this is your constellation, and there's not very much happening. If you're looking at the flow of scenes and nine chapters, there's a very neat alteration, indoor, outdoor, indoor, outdoor. Uh, it's, very, it's very well constructed, and the beginning goes back to the end. And we have uh, the Una Hörte Begebenheit, uh, which is a, the novella theory, which goes back to Goethe, Goethe's, no, Goethe's novella about the tiger. Uh, so we have the, the unheard of event that triggers everything. So we have certain symbolic happenings. We have, uh, we have the uh, walk in the woods. We have the uh, runaway horse. And we have the storm on, on the ocean. I mean, the stuff is, I mean, it's actually very mechanically constructed. You almost don't see it because the language is subordinate dialogues. So it's actually not really dialogues because they're mainly indirect speech, but they, they appear to be dialogue because the language is so extraordinary, so vivacious that it puts you into uh, mise en scène, that it puts you right into, into the scene. So, but what is happening in that, in that novel, in that novella? What's he, what's he doing with all this? Why did he write this? And what is the experiment, the Gedanken experiment that He's cooking up here. I mean, you you basically have to do something with the characters, and that's really your only, your only choice. I'm glad you're sitting there because now you're sitting by my side, which is very good. So okay, so what's going on? So are these contrasts? Are there elective affinities? What's 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 happening there? And now we we'll go back to something that you said at the very beginning, Claudia right? Sanders. Uh, just at the beginning somewhere, uh, the impression I had after yeah. perhaps reading half of it, yeah. that Klaus is uh, the missing half or the missing part. Of, uh, the missing part, that's very good. So you do not see them as a contrast, right? You right. see them actually as maybe mirror images? <coughs> yes. As mirror images? It's book. Missing half how? Could you develop that more? It's book in a way to see how Klaus remembers so many things Good. about, um, I keep forgetting. Uh, about the school? Helmut. Hel Helmut, sorry. <laughs> of Helmut's early life. Right. That's the right. They've spent right. together. You go to the opening of chapter two. Okay, which is actually very interesting. It starts very rare for about the start with the word plötzlich, suddenly. Suddenly, a very, a plötzlich and augenblick are two very important words in Wilhelm Meister, in Goethe's Wilhelm Meister. Uh, augenblick is essential, and suddenly, it's like an epiphany. Suddenly, out of the blue, so they're sitting there in Kübelingen at the little promenade and nothing much is happening, and he gets really bothered that his wife wants to sit all the way in front, and you know, it's like right up under the, everybody's, you know, bellies and boobs, and he doesn't really want to be there, because he would like to sit all the way back. But he is put way, pushed way up in front, and boom, suddenly an appearance. And this appearance, this Klaus, actually very interesting, the guy called Klaus Buch, you know, it's almost like closed book, and he is not an open book. He appears there with a shirt, you know, if I was to unbutton this, I would look like him, but he appears there with a shirt all the way unbuttoned, and he appears to be very open. But what he does is he parades his physicality. 
Okay, so we know this guy, this Klaus, even though he's called Buch, is certainly not an open book. In fact, it's a closed book, Klausus. Yeah, and Klausus actually, if you, Klaus or Klaus, he is actually the most concealed person you could possibly think of. So you are actually presented with a character who is a contradiction in, in himself. Because on the one hand, he presents physicality, sexuality, youth, success, everything is easy for him. And we learn at the very end that what we see is not what is. That there's a contradiction in here. You want to jump in? Well, I was just Please. thinking um, it could be argued that his memories about Helmut are completely fictional because Helmut doesn't descend yeah. to them. But at one point when he's trying to remember what the physics professor said downstairs, he says, you know, I, what, what I mean, he has, it, this is what you think about what, what, what Andrew said, he has very physical memory. And when he remembers something, it is like a puppet show, like a puppet theater. Everything comes to life, all the persons come to life, and that memory is triggered by the exact words, by the mojures. It's like a plastic wrist, yeah? You need to have something as plastic, as precise, as graspable, as, as imaginable, as this word plastic wrist in which that, the, 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 the rock became, the plastic sausage. So his memory gets triggered by the mojust. And that mojust is provided by this guy. And we know because he says, there's a coming, he says, Klaus says to him, Henry, help me, help me. I need to have this memory and to get it. And then we never expect that Hamel actually remembers because he says, for me, it's ein Schädelstätten Zustand. Okay, Schädelstätte is a Calvary, Golgotha. Calvary. So for me, to be in memory is to be at Golgotha or to be at uh, Calvary. Calvary Zustand, and it's a, a state of being at Golgotha, which re represents, of course, the pinnacle of suffering. Not a, when you're just on the brink of being saved. Just on the brink of what that's what Calvary represents. You are at the pinnacle of suffering, but you have the possibility of being saved through resurrection. We're talking Christian universe here, obviously. Okay, so for him, it's a Schädelstätten Zustand, whereas for him, it's the highest of physical realization when you can remember precisely and lively. But he needs, and this goes, this is in the first, in the second chapter when he, when, when he appears, it's like the second page or so, when he says, it's like the Kriegsveteranen. It's like veterans of war. Again, this is war that you know, what you remember, the life that you had before. It's like a war that you were fighting. They need each other to reaffirm that what they lived was real. So you are impression that they are actually in need of each other, these two. They are very different people. They are in fact opposites, but they are complementary opposites. They need each other. Yes. I was going to say, I see them as opposites, and in fact, he tells you they're opposites. Look at what they're they're absolutely the absolutely opposite. One sure. smokes, the other doesn't. One absolutely. drinks, the other. And did you get that? There's a fabulous line. I mean, it is amusing where uh, uh, where, Hilmer, that. where Helmut and <laughs> Sabina talk about reading Dessard and Mazok, <laughs> and, and and Klaus and uh, uh, Sabina are reading herbs and weeds. Herbs <laughs> and weeds. And in fact, and in fact, I grew up. My mother, my, my grandmother, is from Switzerland, and she spent a lot of time in, in this area, which actually my mother now lives uh, in Wasserburg, in, in precisely in Mitten, where Schwanen House is actually is actually set. So I know this area like like the back of my hand. And this book that is mentioned by this by this Pfarrer, Pfarrer Künzel, Ruth und Urhut. I grew up with that. Really? My, yes, my, mother did, did my grandmother did medicine from that book. It's a real book. And going out and collecting all the stories, it's a real thing that people would be doing there. And, and this book actually actually exists. And to see on the one hand, one reads Kierkegaard, and the other one reads Hult and Hult. <laughs> it's actually very funny. It's actually a, 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 a Swiss But Swiss also, story. one of them, I, I believe, Helmut is a man of the forest. He makes it very clear he loves the forest. And Which one? Helmut. Helmut. Oh, Helmut. And Klaus is a man of the water. He loves the ocean or the sea. Oh, forest, not forest. I heard forest. Okay, forest, I was thinking. Yes, that is true. So on the one hand, so we have here the waves, huh? And here we have the trees, which is also why you have your Golgotha, right? 
Okay, which of course is always like compared to, I'm sorry for the Jews, but you know, sorry for me to make those crosses here, so the Tzelem, but here is your, here's your forest, but, but even as Helmut wants to lead them through the forest, it is Helmut who succeeds. To get the horse, you mean? No, even who finds the restaurant, they get lost oh. when, they, when, when they have their walk. Okay, so now what about the horse? Huh? And you're bored by it, okay, do it anyway. I mean, it's, it's, it's untrammeled, you know, vitality and sexuality. Vitality, yeah, okay, good, excellent. Now related to the water. Well, the wind, the wind, the wind blows the boat. It's untrammeled vitality and sexuality. There's no okay. controlling it. All right, and now if you're, connect, if you're thinking about uh, Schwanenhaus, you will know that the uh, Helene, Helene character is the Barbie character there, and she is a surf a surfer, and the German word for surfing is Wellenreiten. You're riding the waves. There isn't that much difference between riding a boat and riding a horse. And in fact, it is made clear in, in Schwanenhaus at some point when we're talking about this Wellenreiten, when, when Barbie, who is the Helene character, uh, there's always one beautiful woman who is sort of born out of the water and succeeds in the water and is, you know, this beauty is like Lida and the swans, like Helene is born out of, you know, Lida and, Lida and Zeus and so the out of the eggs come, comes, comes Helene. And so this Helene character, this Helena character is in Schwanenhaus, the one who is also the surf master, the one who is riding, the one who's riding the waves, at which of course the guys never succeed with such grace. So we have this riding the waves and we have this moment, we have this moment of, well, the key moment really at which he kicks the rudder out of the, out of the hand of Klaus. Why does he do it? Why does he do it? Yeah. Wow, I mean, that's what the book is about. That's what the book is about and that's what he's trying to explain. What's your bet? Okay, many critics have accused uh, Walzer, or not accused Walzer, but have claimed that this is a crime and that this is actually a killing. Okay, and this is what Balzer has to say about that. Um, let me see if I can find that. Uh, he says, also der, also der Kritiker war, zu den dramatischen Höhepunkten ihrer Novelle gehört die Segelpartie auf dem stürmischen Bodensee. Jede Szene, wo der, jene Szene, wo der ängstliche Helmut, dem cleveren Seemann, Klaus die Pinne aus der Hand steckt, was zur Folge hat, dass Klaus über Bord geht. Handelt es sich da um einen bewussten Mordversuch, wie es einige ihrer Kritiker hineingewiesen haben? So the, the, the guy asked, was it a conscious attempt at murder? And Walzer says, nein, das nicht. Einmal hat Helmut einfach Angst und dazu kommt natürlich auch die angestaute Wut. Aber es ist vor allem die Angst. Uh, so habe ich es auch verstanden, sagt der Kritik dann. Um sich zu retten, macht er den, den Fehlversuch. Ja, sagt dann der Walser. Aber natürlich muss er oder sein Gewissen sich nachher fragen, war nicht unbewusst Absicht im Spiel. Okay, so first Walser says, oh no, 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 it was just fear. Um, and uh, he, he really, he was just, he was afraid. And we can see in the text, if you're going to go into that scene, uh, you see that he you notice that the notice that the water is coming into the boat, and that the only way, okay, and now we we, we have to look at, at what Klaus is doing at that moment. We haven't looked carefully enough yet, okay? So uh, so what he's doing and, and, and is 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 really he's really afraid, but he's also very angry, and it's a release of his angeschaute Wut, of his pent up of his pent up anger. And then he asks, well, the, the critic says, well, this is the way I understood it too. And then Balzac qualifies it and says, yes, but of course, um, he also has, has to ask himself, or he has to ask his conscience, if unconsciously it wasn't intentional. So Balzac wants to have his cake and eat it too. What we have to look at, okay, is now what is, and this is the most interesting character in the book, what is Klaus all about? We know the other character. Uh, was his name Helmut? You know, he's a then midlife crisis and feels competitive and he wants to be close to wife, but he doesn't really want to do it. And he feels oyster spiel. There's nothing more. He's just played out. He's like he this no 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 spark no no nothing. I mean, typical, academic, to, typical middle age academic. Yeah, middle age academic. But he's, like a, yeah, he's a school teacher and he doesn't. No, and, he's a 
university teacher. No, it's a, no. No, it's a gymnasium teacher. What, what is uh, Eberhard uh, Ludwig? What is that? Ludwig is his friend. Ludwig is his friend. No, 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 no. He, he says the name of the place. Oh, that's a gymnasium. He's a gymnasium. gymnasium. He's a gymnasium. He's a high school teacher. For sure. Wait, it's, it's an old, old language. What do you mean it's an old language? Ah, uh, yeah. So, uh, it's, 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 yeah. It's one it, of the it teachers, teachers. It teaches Latin and uh, Greek. It's the only one. Which I see. Right. Because he's very proud. It's he doesn't. Oh yeah, it's a very yeah. at yeah. this time it's a fancy thing. It's a very, it's a very fancy thing. So you, learn, you learn ancient Greek and 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 Latin. Oh, that's interesting. In, oh, in yeah. addition to other languages. Yeah, it's but like going to the Phillips Exeter Academy. Yeah. Yeah. It's like going to to one of those fancy boarding schools. It's yeah. it's yeah. not yeah. boarding yeah. school. Of it's course. not a boarding school. No, it's a public school, but you gotta go really work for it. Oh, that actually changes my view. <coughs> but it still looks uh, it doesn't compare. <laughs> it changes my view because um Oh good. You know the reference he's making to uh, you know to Saad and Mazok and yeah. uh, Kierkegaard and Swedenborg and uh, so I assumed he's teaching philosophy in a college. Oh no. Yeah. Are we actually, do we actually know what he's teaching? I don't but you teach you teach in the gymnasium in Germany. You teach philosophy. You used to. I guess. But we I went guess to school. Not in Newton South when he when he. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The last Seven. year of in high school the first year of college. Yeah, so first German year. high school teacher are the best paid in Europe yeah. after Switzerland. Just to make this clear, yeah. Swiss German Dutch teachers are the best paid in the world. Uh, yeah, so I mean, we, we always say. But they have a rather high standard. Right. When you go to college here, you basically have done all of this in 12th and 13th classes. So 12th and 13th grade in a German gymnasium are like freshman, sophomore year in an American college. There's no question about that. You get a very good education, you used to get a very good education. It's not a simple change all the way. But in the olden days, we really had to work very hard uh, for this kind of stuff. I mean, you start, you start learning, you, you, you back me up. And I, I went to a naturwissenschaftlich gymnasium. There's two, two, two tracks. You can go to humanistic, you then need to start with Greek and Latin, and you get French and English, or you start with the science, like you probably did also. We take English at age 10, and then we get two years later, you do French, and two years later, you do Latin. And by the time you're done, you have Latin, you have Latin, French, and, Latin French, and English. We didn't do Latin. Oh, we did Latin. I have to go Latino. And then and you have physics, physics, chemistry, math, and biology. So wait, does gymnasium mean high school or is it a special kind of? No, you go from age ten to age eighteen. It's eight it's years of going of going there. It's it's the the higher ed education. Okay. So does every German oh, kid? No, 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 it's track. No, it's track. It's track. There's three tiers at which you go. You can go to Hauptschule. You go to about age sixteen, and then you do an apprenticeship. You can go to Realschule, you go to about 12th after the 12th class, and then you go to a specialized um, uh, Hochschule, Fachhochschule, where you become a, a, a technician, a higher, a higher level technician. Or you go to gymnasium, and from there you go to university. So that's, it, it's tracked very early on, which is one of the tragedies that basically by age 10, you have to make a decision where you're going educationally. But Much of this has not been reformed. Much I, of this I was teaching at a gymnasium in 1970, 71, and already then students could switch from Realschule to gymnasium. It's tough. It can be done, it can, and it will be done, but it's rarely done because it's a very, used to be very stratified society and used to be very tough. And there is a class issue no longer that there used to be at this time when this novel was written. There's a class issue associated with that. You either are very ambitious or you are a sort of upper class person who can afford to go to the class. I've a class of kids that came from the Ralph Oh, well, that's very, really, that's very really good. It's really done. What state? Now for for oh, my best friend. Now for Walzer, he never got to go to a gymnasium. So for him, it's always something that he was, um, he went to an Oberrealschule in Lindau, and he had to be very glad that he could go because he was drafted into the army. So he served in the Wehrmacht, or actually a bear, he was a flakhead that was very young when he was drafted, he was born in 1927. And he went to the Arbeitsdienst uh, in 1943, and he was actually a flag for something in 1944. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole issue about whether he was in the NSDAP because his, his admission to NSDAP was April 20th, 19. 
44, I want to say, so which is one of those things that you had in Hitler's birthday, so yeah, yeah. a lot of people were just drafted. Then, and then he in, in later um, volunteered for the Jäger, uh, for the Gebirgsjäger, so he actually volunteered in order to get away from uh, from the uh, from being just a, a cannon fodder. Well, well, while we're on this topic, can yeah. we explore it a bit more? Because in can we do this while we're doing that? I want to do this when we do the, the speeches because that's when we're talking about the politics. I want to. I really want to talk. Swanville talks about there's this strange comment where he says, "Well, ah. some of us were dying in Russia." So, uh, ah, okay, Schwan. Could we, could we, can we just finish? Can we just finish Klaus, and then we can go to the Schwanen House? And what does it mean that the Schwanen House gets destroyed? Because this is a political <coughs> comment, okay? So, but I do want we we left this poor Klaus hanging. Huh? He's <laughs> hanging like this. So let's liberate What is he doing? What is the justification? What exactly is the state of Klaus? Klaus is a much more volatile, much more interesting character than the fairly stable, boring Bodenspecht, uh, uh, whatever his name is, Helmut. He's a much more interesting character. Why is Klaus doing what he is doing? And isn't it true that he wants to take, I'm just putting, putting this out as a bit, Helmut down? Isn't he killing both of them? Isn't it possible? Isn't it just possible? What is the situation on that lake? Well, so Kellett's become convinced that Klaus is insane to have insisted on their staying there um, as the storm has mounted. Right. And so he, he could be fighting against somebody he views as insane and wanting to kill them both. Um, we have. But, but I actually thought of it as a liberation yeah. of, of Helena and that he was saving Helena even though. Oh, very cute. Um, and so maybe it's not really murder if it happens to Klaus because he's so like um, endlessly intrusive and um, yeah. aggressive against the element. But we know at the very end we do learn, okay? We do learn, in fact, you, you know that Helmut always, when he wants to be the master of dissimulation, he, would, he gets great pleasure when people can't read him. And he says, my greatest joy is when the difference between what I feel and what I show is the greatest and people can't read me, okay? He wants to really pretend it. But the real master of this simulation is Klaus, the one who cannot be read. You are not on right now, but you were on a, a, a lot, okay? Um, you have to comment. We want to go develop this Klaus thing. So what's going on on this boat? And then I'll I said in, in the end, Klaus came out that he always was in competition with Helmut. There, and that's right. Klaus sees himself in competition with yes. Hamlet from day it's one, it's even though Klaus was the first one. Absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a it's competition going on, and he is now very insecure. And now that he has, he's very insecure. His life, in fact, his life is in total shambles. He can't even afford to be where he is. He can't afford to go to Bahamas. And to see this guy Klaus sitting there is like life saving to him. But you can see he's not getting anywhere. Yes. I, I can't remember the details, but it really struck me when I read it that Klaus was very provocative toward Helmut. Oh, very so much so. Very, yeah, very, really in, very in your face. His pushing, pushing him in, in his face, really wants him, but doesn't do it subtly because he doesn't have the inner strength to, to tone it down. He needs to be all out front. He needs to convince right now, and it's not working because he can feel how Klaus is pulling, uh, how Helmut is pulling back. Helmut wants to pull back, and he can, and he can, can take it. I'll let you jump in now. And then I want to finish Klaus. 